this is uh, the, the last but not the least uh, session and uh, we will be talking about institutional measures and uh, we should have been uh, four people on the stage but we are only three because Promodoros Zivos from Greece is sick. I would like to start with the situation today when you look upon it from a true reuser. I am representing the PSI Alliance. We are about 200 companies that has as a main goal to, to find ways of reusing public information, influencing the different ministries, influencing the commission, the parliament, the council to make as good as regulation as possible. And we also gather good practice and of course bad practice. Bad practice we call complaints. So I will talk about some of the complaints too. And if we start with this situation today, I would like to say it's very difficult to get an overview of available public data. I would like you, every one of you, to go to an authority, any authority, and ask them for information about the data you can reuse. And of course, ask them especially for the downloading place where you can get the information easily into your computer and make products. And I, I will say most of you will be disappointed because most of the authorities does not have this kind of, of information distribution. And of course we have this, what we call the property rights, intellectual property rights. That means that they often say that we, we have a database right to the information. And that, that means that uh, they can put on restrictions for your use of the information. So that's, that's very important to understand that use of database rights make it very difficult for, for reusers to make products uh, that are very creative and uh, of course are new products and, and, and are not inside a small box. And it's of course very, very difficult to understand the pricing process. Why is the price so different between authorities? Why is the price on information so different between countries? I, I know you have been doing in, in investigations within the LAPSI and I, I would truly read them now and see if you can find out why a transaction in one uh, authority will cost you about uh, five cents and in another authority will cost you 2.50 cents same information. I, I don't know really what's the reason behind that. And of course if you are not satisfied with what you are getting from the authority, the redress process is consuming. My colleagues in PSI Alliance, they have both been fighting for 10 years. I only been fighting for nine years. So I, I still have one year to fight more. The problem is, if you lose after 10 years, perhaps you will have to go to a Greek island and, and uh, have a vacation. It's very difficult to, to cope with uh, a decision after 10 years. So I, I think it's, it's time consuming. And uh, what I want to say is that we, from, from, from the point of view of reusers, we have said that we really want to have a solution based upon need for help from a third party. And you wonder why a big company like ours need help from a third party. We surely do because what you actually meet when you come to an authority, they say from the beginning, we do not negotiate. Okay, you, you do not negotiate. No, no, we do not negotiate. Because everyone will be treated equally and we can't negotiate only with your company. And that, that means that if you want to have a discussion with an authority, you surely read help from a third party. And uh, what, what's the meaning with a third party? I would, I would truly say it's not one authority only. It could be one authority. It's not a new authority within the, company, within the country. It could be an old authority. It could be five authorities. As long as it is a third party that we could have help from. And the purpose of a third party 
is really to encourage the reuse and explain the purpose to the different authorities and to describe the benefits. It's not only conflicts to be solutions that you have a solution on, it's also to promote the use of reuse. And it's also to set standards for licensing and for agreements between the authorities and the users. We need someone to, to set the standards and I, I don't think it's possible only to do it from the, 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 the perspective of the Commission. And it is to enforce on anti-competitive behavior and unfair pricing. We have a lot of authorities out on the market, I can promise you. And they are doing business, I can promise you. And they are doing business on their own conditions, I can promise you. So sometimes, and sometimes very often, you need help from the competition authority to see whether it's an anti-competitive behavior and it's an unfair market. I could give you several examples, but I won't do it now. And of course, it's to arbitrate disputes, to help you to, 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 to discuss with the authority and come to a win-win situation. And of, we need a third party to monitor the effectiveness and the performance of the different authorities. There is a suggestion within the new, new uh, directive amendments saying that they should give reports into uh, the Commission every second year, I think. But in, uh, first, but if you look at the last suggestion from our neighbor country, Denmark, it's, uh, I think it's uh, between 25 years or, oh no, I think it's four years or something like this. Uh, countries don't want to be supervised. Just understand that. And uh, of course, if you want to have a service portal with information of the inf about data from different uh, authorities, they could help you with that, this third party that we are looking for. Uh, and that's why we are so positive to the suggestions from the Commission regarding the amendments in the directive. But we are not so positive regarding the discussions within the Council. And not, we are a bit more positive regarding the discussions within the Parliament. And I realize that this is normal, that the Commission and the Parliament stays closer to each other than the Council. So, and, and it's difficult to me, being a Swedish citizen, realizing that my country is writing letters to the Council saying they don't want the regulatory body. Even the Parliament of Sweden is writing uh, letters to the Parliament saying we don't want a regulatory body. What I did, I went up to the Swedish responsible minister and I asked him, why do you do this to me? You know me, <laughs> I'm, I'm a decent guy, you shouldn't write these kind of letters. And then he said, I will tell you something, it's in between us, and now it's in between us. <laughs> we, 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 we certainly are not against regulatory bodies. We, we are against the intervention of the European Union. We don't think the European Union should tell us how to do with our administrative systems. So we just say to them, stay away. And then he said to me, we will investigate a regulatory body. But he didn't say for you. But I, 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 I thought he said it for me. He will try to find out whether you can have an, a regulatory body or not. And it's very important to understand that the solutions for supervision or dis uh, abrogating disputes and so on have to be different from country to country. All countries are different. All countries have different administrative procedures. All countries have different laws. So you have to make a solution for every country, 27 countries. But they have to do it. And that, that means that we have to start from that point that we look upon the directive as a very good sign on where you should be going. And then the country have to do the best way of solving this kind of supervision. So, so I, I think that a lot of countries are really positive having these kind of bodies, but they will do it their own way. 
So, by saying this, that the PSI reuses are extremely positive to regulatory bodies. If you didn't hear that before, we think it's a very good solution, and we think the Commission has done a very good work. And we've seen one thing, that if you realize and if you learn what PSI reuse is, and if you do investigations, and if you gather facts, suddenly you get up on a level where you really know what kind of suggestions you should make. That means the Commission has been doing a very good work. So now they are up on the same level as we are, so we can discuss these questions. But the Parliament and the Council has a long, long way to go. That means they take political decisions without really knowing the facts. So I've, I've told them when I meet them, I say, there is a 400 pages report called the POPSIS report from the Commission. Read it. And if they have read it, I will assure you they are more positive to the suggestions that are part of the amendments of, of uh, the directive. So I, what I wanted to do as a start, taking the time of my Greek friend, was to tell, say some positive words about regulatory bodies. But we want to have a balance up here. So I have a person from the University of Murcia, this is the way to pronounce it in Catalonia, Murcia, and she is called Magnolia Prado, and she will talk about the negative things, how difficult it is to have a regulatory body, what you, what you really have to do, finding out there are alternatives to this, and, and, and she, she, will, she will speak about that. And then we will have Kathleen, we'll talk about if you want to do something about it, how do you do, where do you start, what do you think about, and so on. So, we have two persons that make a better balance from what I'm saying here, because I'm representing the reuses. And I always say, there is no reuse without reuses. Now you know that. So we'll start with you, Magnolia, and uh, you are a lecturer in constitutional law, and uh, you have been researching uh, related to fundamental rights, freedom of speech, privacy, data protection, jurisdictional powers, independence, and responsibility, separation of powers, uh, and a lot of other things. So if someone is competent on this, is Magnolia. So uh, I give the word to you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and good morning, LAPSI partners. Thank you very much, Rolf, for your kind words. I think I don't deserve them, but thank you very much anyway. And before starting my intervention, I would like to apologize to the host country because I am not speaking in Italian. Sorry, I took lessons many years ago, but I never passed the first level, the so-called Itagnolo, so I will have to try to do my best in English. I would like to be very flexible and just share with you some of the ideas that my colleagues at Murcia and I have been discussing because we think that to talk about PSI or not really to talk about PSI, to focus on the directive because we are here, in fact, to see if the directive should be amended and in what way we need legal imagination. And that is what we have been trying to use. Okay. I really like the, the main title of the, of the whole workshop, what is needed in institutional terms. Why do I like it? Because it's a very inviting question. Why it's an inviting question? Because instead of thinking of an answer, uh, when I see what is needed in institutional terms, I immediately think in three other questions. Why are we so worried about institutional aspects? What do we mean when we say institutional aspects? And do we really need something? Or what, what do we need? So, so let's start with the first question. Why are we talking about institutional aspects? Well, of course, there are always good reasons to talk about institutional aspects because they are extremely important in almost every legal issue. But I think that right here in LAPSI, we are talking about institutional aspects because one of the proposals 
to amend the directive is exactly, you know, I think you, you have the, in the writing, you have the proposal for the new reduction of Article 4, which includes an express mention of an independent authority. So here we are talking about institutions because we have to talk about that independent authority. If it's a good option, if it's not, the pros, the cons, the benefits, the inconvenience, that's why we are here talking about institutions. Uh, well, this is something. Then, what do we mean when we say institutions? Because the truth is that I think that when we say institutions, in fact, we mean competencies, functions, powers, proceedings. Institutions are not empty structures or empty actions. If we think of them like that, I think they are completely useless. When we think about institutions, in fact, we think, what can they do? Can they really apply the law in a proper way? Do they have the proper law to apply? So that's why at the end of my intervention, I will go back on the topic of competence, because I think that we can I think that that is the key point. And then, what is needed in institutional terms? This is a really surprising question, because really, we need something else in institutional terms? I mean, to be a member of state, you have to be a democracy, which automatically implies that you have a distribution of powers, you have a supposed a well-developed administration, already complex enough and prepared enough to apply the law according to the rule of law and to serve the public interest in a general way. So, do we really need something else? Our institutions in the 21st century are not well prepared enough to deal with PSI reuse? Well, it seems that they are not. We see why. Why? Well, because the truth is that um, since the since 2003, people who have been dealing in the practice with reuse have found several problems, several practical problems. What do they say? Sometimes we don't know what is reusable. It's impossible or very difficult. We don't know who is the administrative authority who must deal with PSI reuse and who is to give me a license. I don't know if I need a license or if I don't. And if I have a conflict, with the administration, because they say you cannot reuse, mm, it will take forever to solve that problem. Mm, very complex process, proceedings, mm, slow, it takes a long time, they are expensive, not to mention that if you don't like what the administration finally tells you and you decide to go to court, then more money, more time. And because of the, all these practical problems, we have, some people have started thinking with, uh, I call it in, in logical jumps. We are in step first, step one, and suddenly we have moved towards step five, forgetting step two, three, and four. So it's like if we say, mm, I have a practical problem, and instead of fixing the problem, or at least trying to fix the problem, I will create a new institution that will fix the problem. Why? Maybe we don't need, I'm not saying that we don't need independent authorities. I'm saying that maybe we don't need them we don't need them now. Maybe it's a little bit premature to take the decision right now, and we should wait a few years, and we should try to fix the problems in a different way, and if still it doesn't work, and we see that we go nowhere in reuse, and then let's talk about independent authorities. Why do I say this? Because, for instance, one of the problems, uh, the proceedings before the public administration are too slow. Well, then solu the solution is not a new institution, maybe the solution is a faster proceeding. I think so. Uh, I don't know what PSI is reusable. Well then, maybe the solution is not to create a new institution. So this institution will tell us what is reusable and what is not, but instead what we should do is state clearly in a law, in a regulation, by an administrative act, what is reusable and what is not. And the truth is, I don't want at all you to think I don't want that I am against these independent authorities. It's just that I think we should wait for many reasons. And because what well, Prodromos was supposed to speak about the benefits, I felt that I had to speak about the inconvenience, which I find, really, I find inconvenience of all kinds. 
Maybe I, I think I am even forgetting some in my exposition. The first, this is the easy one. High economical cost. More institutions, more complex administration, more money. And do you think that right now the situation demands more expensive? Because I think that we are exactly in, on the other side. In, in Spain, that is the country I know very well, we have 18 independent agencies and the new government just decided when they raised the power in November or so that they were going to fuse them in only one independent authority. Why? For many reasons, because it's very expensive and because all these independent authorities at the very end, what they create is legal uncertainty. So we have a problem. Added complexity. That's another problem. All academics say that our administrations are already complex enough and that they should be simplified. And then here we have, no, no, we want another independent agency. And this is a special deep problem if we are talking about decentralized countries. Because in decentralized countries, we are not only going to have one agency, probably we will have one central agency and then one agency in each of the minor entities, like lender in Germany, autonomous communities in Spain. Why? Because PSI has a holder, a public holder, and they are going to say, no, 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 I am competent to take decisions on the PSI I hold, and I will create my own agency. So it's going to be extremely complex. I also find it a little bit paradoxical, really, considering the content of the directive, to start the house by the roof. That is, I would say, why? Because the, the directive, I, of course, is not a detailed directive, but I am afraid that it's not even a framework directive. It's an extremely shy directive. It's, directives are supposed to harmonize law. That is the main aim, I thought. That's what they taught me at the school. And what I find is, Almost nothing is harmonized in this directive, very, very little points. And suddenly, we will not have harmonized law, but we will have harmonized institutions. Why? Because if the directive goes ahead and insists in that independent authority, probably what many of the member states will do is, not all of them, but many of them probably will create these authorities. So we will have a harmonized institution background without harmonized law. And I think really that it is paradoxical. Uh, more problems. Well, it has been said, I think I heard it in Brussels, one of the main topics, which will be the function, the powers, the functions, the competencies of these independent authorities. And I heard they would have judicial powers. My answer is no way. That is it. No way, not in Europe, not with separation of powers, and not as long as the judicial power still exists. So judicial powers are only for courts of justice. Forget about that. And not only that, we have that independent, um, sorry, the existence of a judicial power and the separation of powers brings some problems to the independent agencies. What do we find? that depending on where the PSI comes from, these independent agencies will be completely useless. They will be able to solve any problem related to PSI mm, held by the public administration. But if the PSI is held by constitutional courts, by parliaments, or by judicial power, they will be completely incompetent to solve any practical problem. I mean, of course, the PSI from the judicial power could be reusable. Of course, the PSI from constitutional courts or the PSI from parliaments can be reusable. Because it would be reusable if a law says that it has to be reusable. But mm, the problem is that, for instance, if the high, judicial country, the, high, the high judicial council of a country suddenly mm, decides to celebrate an exclusive agreement with a reuser, and someone, another reuser, finds that we have a competence pro a free competence problem, it would be impossible to take that agreement to the independent authority. Why? Because to, according to 
key principles in constitutional law, independent judicial authorities are independent, completely independent, and they will never be submitted to administrative authorities. So, of course, we are talking about a very small pieces of PSI, but still very important. Um, more problems, well, material problems. Not all PSI is the same, and not all PS PSI raises the same problems. For instance, uh, we might find very pacific PSI, no problems at all. But then we might find that some PSI is dangerous to reuse because it could affect privacy or personal data protection. For instance, judicial resolutions, plenty of names, plenty of addresses, who is the witness, privacy of victims. So, um, we already have laws that say that, that PSI is reusable but with extremely care. So, um, all PSI always offers the same problems? Right now, it's not included in the directive, but imagine cultural PSI. Once in a future, it's included. What will be the problem? In that case, probably the problem will be the collision between PSI reuse and intellectual property. So each type of PSI raises a different problem. And maybe we find that just one independent authority is not the best solution because we already have another administrative bodies or judicial bodies better prepared to solve the problems. When we talk about independent authorities, we can either create a new authority or use one of the pre-existing ones. Imagine we take the first path, we create a new one, and suddenly mm, there is a case related to PSI reuse that involves a problem with data protection. Who is competent? The independent agency for PSI reuse or the independent agency for data protection? In this case, I think the solution is kind of easy because data protection, personal data protection, is a fundamental right and most of our legal systems, maybe not all, but most of our legal systems, we will consider that um, the fundamental rights have what we call visa attractiva. So, of course, it will be competent, the data protection agency. But what if we have a case that involves PSI reuse and free competition law? Who will be competent to solve that problem? An exclusive, uh, imagine a problem with an exclusive agreement that breaches some duty or competition law. I don't know. Who is competent? The competition law agency or the PSI reuse agency? So what will we have? More collisions, more different agencies. Imagine we take then the different solution. We will not create a new one. We will use one of the pre-existing institutions, one of the pre-existing independent authorities. Which one? The, the one that has been mentioned more often is Data Protection Agency. And I don't really see why, because this would be like sleeping with the enemy. Because it's like exactly the opposite. PSI reuse stands for transparency and Data protection agencies in many systems clearly stand, stand for privacy. So, I don't know if it's an appropriate one. One more thing that should be said about PSI reuse. Are we going to consider PSI as a whole? Or are we going to fragment PSI depending on the material aspects? Because maybe that's an easy solution. Oh, oh sorry. Oh, I think that well, the, problem, the PowerPoint ends here, but anyway, I don't want to be negative with, about independent agencies. It's just that I feel it's not the moment, really. We should wait, because probably the problem is not really institutional. I think the problem is somewhere else. The law is not precise enough. We don't have good regulations. Uh, maybe in some countries, depending on the legal culture, Public administration is reluctant to allow PS, PSI reuse, could be. Uh, and I think we should try first another, we should try another, another way, a different way. Use soft law measures, I think 
Kathleen will talk about that. Uh, I think we should try to change the directive in a different way. And what do we need in institutional terms? I think that we need we need institutions to do their homework at both levels. We need European institutions to do their homework and national institutions to do their homework. Why am I saying this? Because maybe, and I guess that if we are here, the Commission is interested in promoting ESI reuse, otherwise we wouldn't be here, maybe the proper way to do so is to be a little bit, how would I say, brave would be the word? No, I don't know. And take a risk, go further. Uh, I know that access is a member state competence, and I know that reuse, which is closely, closely linked to access, it's a member state competence, of course. We will respect that. But then the directive can say that member states, because they are competent to regulate reuse, should regulate reuse. Why? Because if they, they keep silent or with these vague regulations, inadequate regulations, they are causing a damage to the internal market. So I cannot regulate reuse as the European Union, but I can tell you to do so because if you don't do your homework, I cannot carry on my competencies in a proper way. And if you don't tell me clearly what is reusable and what is not, probably I will have to consider that then you mean that that is reusable. Uh, I can also understand, as the European Union, that if general access is possible, that means that, that PSI is reusable. And I can also try to be... I, can, I, I think I would use imagination because I think that we need a new perspective. We constantly think of PSI as a whole competence. But what if PSI reuse weren't a real competence? What if it is just an instrument that is part of other competencies? The European Union is competent in, in environment, to protect the environment. So maybe the reuse of environmental information is a piece they need to properly achieve the competence of protection of the environment. Public health. The European Union has competencies on public health, don't they? Well, maybe the reuse of information related to public health is an instrument that I need to properly carry out my competence on public health. That is a different perspective that implies two things. Using the doctrine of implied powers, and fragmenting PSI. What else can the directive do? If we are complaining, reusers, academics, stakeholders, everyone, uh, uh, conflict, resolution of conflicts is very slow. The directive can use what we call um, non-content-based duties. No, no, I'm not telling you how to proceed, I'm just telling you that you must end the proceeding in a short time, three months. What proceed? After six months. No, that, I, I don't know how many months, in a fast way. If they are complaining because proceedings are slow, introduce weaker procedure. No, there are many possibilities and I think that I have run out of time. So thank you very much for your attention and for your patience. Great, grazie mille per l'attenzione. And I know there is a British writer who said that poetry is that lost in translation. Is that lost? Well, mm, my ideas for sure are not poetry, but I hope that they didn't get lost in translation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm just, it was breathtaking, I can tell you. And, uh, I can tell you one thing more, the paper she has been writing is much nicer. <laughs> she just took the opportunity to be extremely negative. So, so, but there was a lot of things to listen to, but, but uh, we will run out of time if I will comment on it. I will just make a remark that uh, please, please read the Open Data White Paper from the UK and then you see a lot of solutions on uh, institutional uh, basis. So, so there are solutions on this one. But I, I think I will instead give the words to Kathleen and then we discuss everything afterwards. So, so Kathleen Jansen, she comes from the University of Leuven 
and uh, she is a specialist in access and reuse of PSI and uh, both provision and restrictions. And she has been taking part in many, many projects, uh, responsible, and she's now responsible for the ICRI contribution to the LEPSI thematic network. So she's also extremely competent to talk about this. So I will give the word to you and the microphone. Thank you very much. And, um Good morning or good afternoon to you all. I should probably say I have the honor of giving the final presentation of the day. I will apologize also, it will not be in Italian because all I can do in Italian is order an ice cream and then I'm done. So there's no way I will try anything in Italian. Um, I just, after all, um, Maria Magnolia has already said, um, and she made some points which I will come back to, I just wanted to take a little step back and um, look at how indeed we should be dealing with things and how we should be um, tackling the problems that we've been identifying in the last couple of years. Um, Mario re refers to the idea that we should fix the problems and look where the problems are and try to fix them in the most appropriate places. Indeed, that's the idea also of this presentation on, on how we should look at it. Because if we look back at PSI, it's been a very, very long story. It started in the 1980s already, and now we're 2012. And we've had an enormous amount of material, an enormous amount of policy documents, of studies, of economic studies, of social studies, of political studies, name it, and it's been there in the last few years, or in the last 20 years even. And yet still, it seems that we're still not reaching the potential. The potential of PSI is still not materialized. And you still hear voices saying, well, okay, so... On the other one hand, we have PSI holders saying, well, we're putting PSI out there, nothing's happening. So, I assume that nobody cares. On the other hand, we have PSI reusers still saying, we have all these initiatives, and we have all this legislation, we have all these policies, and yet I'm still not getting what I want. So there still seems to be a problem and there still seems to be a discrepancy in the way the PSI domain is evolving. And maybe we should look at, we've been looking at where the problems come from, from a legal perspective, and there's also been a lot of research from other perspective of where the problems are. Maybe we should take a step back and look at what we can do to solve these problems. And I just came across something that I think is very important that we should keep in mind in whatever it is we propose to improve the PSI domain or the open data domain or whatever you want to call it these days. The first question we should always ask is, is some type of regulatory action required? Do we need to do something? Or will the PSI market in this case, will it solve itself? Will it work out the way it's, it should be without any sort of intervention. Second question is, well, if we do need to intervene, with what? What kind of actions should we take? What kind of tools do we need to launch at whatever problem is that we're facing? And the third part of that is, well, who should be part of the process? Who should be involved in trying to find the solution? So if you apply this to what's been going on in PSI and where we should be going, First question is, well, is regulatory action required? You can look at it from generally two perspectives that are quite popular these days. Either you can see it from an evidence-based perspective. The, a very good example of evidence that's been collected is indeed the POPSI study. It shows very clear evidence, very clear empirical analysis of what the field is and what the problems are. You could also look at or make a risk-based analysis, which is something that's been more done with liability or privacy issues. Look at what the risks are if something goes wrong. So if you apply this to PSI, I think, from a PSI perspective, the answer is quite clear. Yes, action is needed. The market is not doing what it's supposed to do without any action. Inspire said the same thing. This is a directive I know quite well, and the effect of that has been very clear that legislation and even a quite strict legislative process 
has made a very big impact in the, on the availability of data and particularly on the availability of good quality, well documented data. So they clearly suggest that regulatory action is needed. The open data history, maybe that suggests that no action is needed if you look at regulatory action in a very limited definition. Because that seemed to have been growing out of nowhere, it's all very relative. So, what can we say? I believe personally that even if you say that open data history suggests that no regulation is needed, it's not the case because regulation was already there. Even though they did not, or the open data movement does not base itself often on regulation, it's there. There's PSI legislation, there's access legislation, there's freedom of information. So, I think the general answer to the question in this case is definitely yes regulatory action is required. But then you start thinking about, well, what action can we take? Do we really need legislative action? And by what does it need to be complemented? And there are some good examples with any kind of measures that are being taken to complement the legislative action and things that we can learn from. Can we supplement by guidance and recommendations, or even replace some elements by guidance and recommendations, or by the soft law, as we like to call it. It seems that many member states are actually asking for more guidance, particularly with regard to licensing. Within member states, public bodies are asking for guidance. It seems that in the UK, it's, it's working quite well, that the National Archives' former OPSI has been giving a lot of guidance, which pays off. So it's something that needs to be, or that needs to be given more attention to in how far guidance and recommendations can already bring us. The same thing goes for good practices and the more dissemination of examples. Um, I've been told that, for instance, in Italy, the example of Piemonte made a very good impression on other regions and they're following the example just by seeing what happens in another region. So dissemination of examples and information on what happens is a very important point. And a third part in that is cooperation between public bodies. It's not something that's necessarily imposed officially. Um, a very good example there is within the INSPIRE framework again, is the Dutch um, body that is responsible for implementing INSPIRE and the German, its German equivalent, have been organizing meetings, have been exchanging information on their licensing policies and they have been working together trying already to fix some cross-border issues and trying to harmonize on what's going on. So leaving some things to cooperation between public bodies, even possibly involving private sector in that case, helps. So again, maybe regulation or a law is not necessary, it can be solved by cooperation. From speaking from the Belgian perspective, actually competition works quite well. Not necessarily only competitions between or organized for hackers and for um, developers, if you like, but just a sense of competition between public authorities. If you see, for instance, in Belgium, in Flanders, Ghent, the local authority of the city of Ghent has been trying to open up data, has been doing quite a good job. First reaction in Leuven, my city, we've been competing for ages, we have to do it too, because we cannot stay behind. So again, the idea of having information on what goes on and stimulating a sense of uh, you have to be in the race because you, you're staying behind may also help in trying to get PSI back on the right direction. Financial incentives, of course, that's the first thing public bodies will say to you, that we need money to do all this. An enforcement mechanism has been already discussed, so I will not go back into it to the pros and cons of what the previous speakers have said. And I think an important element also in trying to organize any sort of PSI system, PSI mechanism, is in the technology. We should try to see what technology can do in making things more automatic, in making things more seamless, in combining data, in getting data. So rights management systems and um, privacy protecting tools, more research and more um, information is needed on what they can do to help. So all these things can be very um, important and very useful in trying to move the PSI system forward and trying to move the P 
PSI regulatory framework forward. And this is something that we should start looking at in the future now that we've really clearly identified what all the problems are. And a third part is, well, who should be involved in the regulatory process? I think this is one of the issues that has been very clear in uh, many countries, and the difference is very clear. There have been countries that in, have transposed the PSI directive and said, well, there we go, we have a law, we're done. Some of them actually made a model license and said, okay, we've made a model license. It's somewhere on a website, you have to go look for it, but it's there, we're done. They have not involved any public sector bodies in trying to get the idea across of what the point is of PSI. They just said, we're transposing, everything will work out, they'll come and ask for it. Obviously that didn't work, so the involvement of stakeholders is essential in this process. It's involving the PSI holders to learn about their concerns and find a way to appease those concerns and say, well, it won't be that much of a problem as you think it is, because many times it's out of ignorance that they say it. It's involving the users. In open data, it seems to be more successful than in PSI. In PSI, we have organizations like PSI Alliance and some other organizations of mostly big data companies who do their work. They represent some smaller companies as well. But if we have the argument that um, open data and PSI is very important for SMEs and that it would make their lives so much easier, we have to involve those SMEs and try to find a way to get to those SMEs because they don't know. And we can regulate whatever perfect directive we have if they still don't know, we're still nowhere after the perfect directive. Activists are obviously a very good way in trying to get the message across. Politicians are a very good way to get the message across. And not just the politicians who have to decide on where the PSI directive goes, because those are the representatives of the member states. They're usually the higher administrative representatives. The idea is to get a politician on board who gets to the news. It worked in the UK. It's the best way to do it in other countries as well. And of course the media, because we seem to think that the UK government got there all on its own, or with the help of Tim Berners-Lee, but it got there with three or four years background in the Guardian's campaign of free our data, and with a lot of publicity about it. Publicity is key, and publicity should come from users, but also from policy makers who want to make sure that the PSI system goes somewhere. So all these elements are important in, in trying to move forward from where we are now. And I think that in very, just some quick ideas of where we need to go, well, anything we do, any sort of regulatory activity we do, it needs to be followed up actively. So just saying, here is a law, problem solved, it will never work. It needs to involve the users. and. I think it's very important that we see who the users are. When we start talking about PSI, users are companies, but users are also citizens, um, particularly if we start looking at open data. And it seems that I've, I was at a workshop on using open data organized by W3C a couple of weeks ago, and the idea there was, well, we involve users, of course, we have organized a number of hackathons, we have invited developers, we have invited hackers, they're not the users there's still an intermediary field between the real users. So we need to reach those real users. Empirical evidence is key, which we realized and we're trying to gather. And I think the most important part is also something Magnolia already said, is well, we need to do it quick. And we need to make sure that whatever it is that we try to regulate does not suffer from the general regulations that we have, and that is that we're slow. Because the, the the other thing that you've been, or that we've been hearing many times is the slogan now is don't ask for permission, but ask for forgiveness. People will just use data and they'll see what happens afterwards, which I think in the circumstances is a good slogan, but we should try to find a way to prevent that and make sure that they know that they have permission in the first place before they have to start thinking about getting forgiveness and trying to solve the problems before they occur rather than after they occur. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Very nice. nice.
now you've heard some pros from me and some cons from, from uh, Magnolia and a more balanced approach from Kathleen. Uh, I <coughs> will not get deeper into that now. I would like to take the opportunity to, to, to listen to your questions to see if we can answer some of them or have a discussion. So, is there anyone who is pro or con? Uh, just uh, maybe try to elaborate a bit on what Kathleen said. Uh, it's been a long process, uh, more than 20 years. Uh, we tried uh, soft law in 89, guidelines uh, didn't work. Uh, so uh, the directive came and, and, uh, and lots of studies that followed and consultations, including uh, for this review, uh, which showed that uh, the redress mechanism uh, was not uh, working uh, properly, so uh, something should be done to uh, improve that. And now, uh, of course, uh, you can theorize all these difficulties from constitutional and uh, the administrative uh, law point of view, but uh, uh, nothing is uh, imposed uh, uh, in one or the other way. Uh, these independent uh, authorities sometimes already exist. Uh, uh, actually, uh, Slovenia, France and others have, have created this uh, uh, specific uh, PSI uh, kind of supervisory bodies and they are independent and they have uh, sometimes they have binding uh, uh, decisions. Uh, this uh, does not of course uh, discard uh, the normal judicial review that will follow it. It's the same in the UK by the way. Uh, so it's, uh, there's nothing, no conflict whatsoever with the constitutional rules uh, and the necessary judicial uh, uh, control. Uh, um, so, uh, whatever authority already exists um, might do the, the, the job. Uh, it's not necessary to create something uh, new. Uh, but uh, they should kind of promote uh, this uh, new uh, policy because that's one of the issues that uh, seems to be missing. Uh, Kathleen mentioned that uh, countries sometimes just transpose the law and wait for things to happen. But uh, the public sector bodies are sometimes not even aware of this. Uh, the, approach that something should be changed. So the role of this address, uh, redress, uh, enhanced redress mechanism, let's say, will be to uh, kind of uh, get the message through and uh, try to uh, get some consistency in the, in the system. Um, of course, uh, you, you, uh, you have to uh, make them compatible with the, the system as it exists. But you already have these uh, uh, hierarchical, hierarchical uh, appeals. Uh, uh, which uh, exist in normal administration, so maybe uh, the public body that uh, refused the uh, reuse, uh, uh, there's a possible appeal to his uh, uh, superior or the minister, whatever. So this is an independent uh, 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 control or redress, uh, which is uh, uh, coexisting with the judicial one. So there's nothing uh, really new there. And it's just a, a question of making it more. Um, compatible with the revised directive, which indeed uh, gives some extra competence to this uh, existing or to be created mechanism, uh, such as uh, coordination with other uh, PSI authorities in other member states and uh, exchange of uh, uh, practice whatsoever and reporting. So this uh, uh, would be a way also to alleviate uh, public bodies or, or the uh, uh, authorities uh, from these uh, new tasks because there will be uh, somebody identified uh, in the national uh, systems which will uh, be mandated with these new tasks of uh, reporting and coordinating etc. But uh, of course uh, this is still very much under discussion and uh, the fact that it is new uh, is uh, precisely why some uh, con controversies still, uh, still exist. It was a good remark because uh, there has been many, many, many years that we have been fighting for this and, and uh, of course you are right, I we have to be a bit cautious, but uh, 10 more years is, is too much. We have to do something now, so this is my opinion. We have to act now and we have to take the opportunity that the new directive will give us. The last chance was a couple of years ago and we didn't get it. Now it's a real good chance. Anyone else who wants to? Do you want to comment, Kathleen? Or do we have anyone else? Okay, there. 
volevo chiedere a, in particolare a Pardo Lopez, ma poi se, se vuole rispondere anche da, uh, gli altri al... in realtà per quanto riguarda la direttiva sull'utilizzo del ricorso a autorità indipendenti è una novità non lo è affatto dal punto di vista delle strategie con le quali l'Unione Europea cerca di penetrare negli ordinamenti nazionali anche dal punto di vista eh, istituzionale cioè molto spesso le autorità sono eh, diciamo, indipendenti sono, si richiede che siano eh, indipendenti da altri So, sorry, so what, what do you, was it a remark or was it a question? Yes, no, it's a remark. It was a remark. Yes, yes, yes. I don't, I don't, I don't have to answer it. Yes, yes. No, it, it, dicevo, dal punto di vista della direttiva è una novità il, il fatto di richiedere l'istituzione o la previsione di autorità indipendenti. Dal punto di vista della strategia generale eh, che in molti campi l'Unione Europea utilizza per costruire una rete di amministrazioni che siano in qualche modo più fedeli alla missione o allo scopo della, della normativa europea rispetto a difficoltà eh, o opposizioni da parte degli Stati membri, mi sembra in piena continuità, a mio avviso diciamo, l'intento è quello di fare in modo di eh, avere a disposizione un, uno strumento in più di carattere istituzionale e non soltanto regolativo per poter operare su, ma insomma, anche dal punto di vista della protezione dei dati, le cose sono andate così, eh, dal punto di vista della regolazione dei mercati eh, liberalizzati, le cose sono andate così, non mi sembra, una, cioè, mi sembra qualcosa di già visto. Ecco. Ok, ok, thank you. Uh, even if it's nothing you, new, I say with a good suggestion. So, uh, do we have any more comments on, on this? Julian, you want to come? I had to turn it on. That's important. You know, uh, I'm really aware of the real problem we are facing. I agree with your comment, Luis, but I think the main point is to decide whether the European Union has got a competence to force member states to build up independent authority. Rolf has uh, explained to us that in Sweden they don't want to be forced. Maybe they will do, but they don't want to, 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 to be forced by the European Union. They, want to, they don't want to be obliged because they want to exercise their own competences as a member state. And that's the key point. It's necessary to amend the directive to say, only to say that those member states who want can create an independent authority. Is this really necessary? Are there any better options, for example? Uh, Magnolia hasn't explained it because she had a very little time, but we have been discussing about a new uh, paradigm, I mean. Okay, every member state, every public administration has the right competence to decide whether the information is accessible and reusable. Okay. We cannot discuss about that unless we find a competence by the European Union to force member states to make their information available. And the, the, the example is the environmental law. Okay. Magnolia has uh, given another example, so maybe we should explore that. But the point is, okay, the European Union must leave to the member states to decide, to decide whether the information is accessible and reusable. Okay, perfect. But maybe the, the European Union can say, okay, if you don't give a response, an answer about the uh, possibility to reuse your information, we will assume that it is accessible and reusable. And we are going to give you one year to decide whether to make it available or not and reusable or not. But after this period, we will assume that your information, as you haven't said anything different, is available and reusable, and you must decide whether the information is not accessible or reusable, not because you want 
there must be a reason. You have to give a clear answer with a reason. You have to motivate, motivate your answer. I think this is a, a more interesting way of facing up the real problems that we are trying to solve from more than 20 years. It's, it's not the access only that we are discussing. We are discussing the conditions and we are discussing the charging. So it's, 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 it's a bit broader question. And I, I still think if you want something to happen, you have to do something now. And, and we will have this discussion going on for, for, for ever and ever and ever. So that this is my point. I have given it twice or three times. So I will I give the word to, to, to Lee. Uh, uh, of course, there may be uh, better solutions and we are always uh, ready to exploit them. Um, uh, as you've seen, uh, the, the, the 2003 directive had uh, already these obligations uh, on the redress mechanism. Uh, Article 4, uh, so all the uh, negative decisions have to be justified and the reasons explained and uh, also the indication of the means of redress. Uh, so all this uh, is already there, it has not changed and will uh, remain so. Uh, now uh, the new feature would be that uh, within this uh, redress mechanism that has already to be there, uh, whether an independent uh, authority uh, might uh, speed up a bit uh, the redress and make, uh, introduce some consistency into the system so that it would work better. But the redress mechanism as such uh, was already there. Thank you, and, and I think uh, our time is running out. Professor Ricolfo is sitting there and wants to come up and, and end the conference. So, so uh, we think we stop there, and, and we hope that there will be uh, uh, discussions within all member states in how to implement these things, and exactly the wording we don't know. It will come out, I think, in, in, uh, in the beginning of 2013, I think. We'll see the, 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 the final words of the directive, and then we'll see how to deal with it in each member state. So, thank you very much, Kathleen, Magnolia, for, for, for your speeches and for the audience for the discussion. So, it will continue for how many years, I don't know, but it will continue. So, thank you very much, and I give the word to Professor Ricoffi. I started off with the thanks yesterday morning and uh, now we are wrapping up and uh, let me start again uh, with uh, the thanks, retroactive thanks for what uh, has been uh, contributed uh, and uh, I would like to remark that this has been a very compact uh, contribution so this, especially in this last session there has been uh, a lot of uh, debate uh, from the table to the floor, from the floor to the table, this has been very productive. Of course, uh, the audience is uh, made off at least uh, by 50% by uh, speakers at the, at the moment. There is not much in, uh, yes, there, there are some people who come from the outside uh, who may thank, uh, uh, but uh, uh, this uh, is really uh, us debating among ourselves with uh, contributions from uh, uh, members of, of, the, of the general audience as well. The other remark I have to, to do uh, beyond and besides the thanks is to, to say that uh, <clears throat> a thematic network has contributions which are measured by the progress from the initial stage to the through the subsequent steps until to the final point and we are getting close to the final point. And yes, I would say that uh, uh, I can measure appreciable progress in all the areas we have been uh, looking at. Uh, licensing is, in my opinion, very close to uh, the cooking point, the point in which uh, the dish is ready to be served on the table. Uh, as far as uh, the independent authorities, it seems to me that uh, we have been preliminary until today. Today, uh, also thanks to the positions taken from uh, the floor, as I was saying, and Julian, I think, has been very clear in this, and Luis as well. 
we have come to visualize what is the real dim dimension. I remember uh, when we had the meeting in May 2011, uh, at the dinner we had, Rolf Northquist was saying, in my opinion, uh, it is the single most important issue, and he has been pressing in this direction uh, from day one. But uh, how and why it is so important an issue, we have come uh, to visualize step by step. And also Benedetto, I think, that gave a contribution. I totally agree that there is a certain dynamic of the interpenetration of uh, uh, European community law into national systems, uh, which has uh, certain steps whereby creating the European rules is step one, and then uh, think about telecommunications, think about railways, uh, think about uh, banking and insurance, uh, there is a moment in which you require to have independent authorities and we can envisage uh, the next steps which are to create links between these independent authorities and maybe to create also a uh, European level uh, authority. This is a general uh, movement. Uh, so the question is, this has been working while the European Union was working. Now the European Union is a moment of retrenchment. Uh, how does this situation fit in the area of public sector information? We should not forget that this is a typically cross-border issue, so it's very difficult to think uh, that we can uh, assume that uh, national solutions, a uh, uh, patchwork of national solutions can work because uh, uh, this would uh, mean uh, that uh, uh, the number of different uh, solutions would be over overwhelming. This is my opinion, of course. But um, the point I wanted to make is, well, it's clear that I'm more pro rather than con, more uh, on the side of uh, um, Rolf and maybe Kathleen than on the side of Mike Magnolia in this debate. Uh, but the point I wanted to make is that this is progressively clarifying as a major issue and the reasons why it is a major issue. So my uh, final comments are that uh, the approach of the thematic network seems to be working at all levels, even though I can reiterate uh, what I was saying yesterday, that there's still missing blocks uh, in our discussion. Some things we're going to finish as deliverables uh, without meeting again in the next future. Uh, but uh, then uh, there is uh, stage one, and we hope that uh, LAPC 1.0 will be followed by LAPC 2.0, and this is our hope. And on these words of hope and appreciation for the jointly conducted work, let me stop. And uh, let me stop noticing that uh, we are on time, uh, and this is always a good sign. Uh, I repeat what Samuel Beckett said at some point, uh, uh, we are not saints, but we made our commitments with punctuality, and not many people may boast as much. Uh, this is what I can repeat once more, and uh, being in Torino and being Italian, I'm pretty proud to be able to say this. Thank you.